Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome again to Lahem Panim. In recent weeks, we've been taking a look at the life and ministry of Stephen, one of the men who was chosen by the apostles to help wait on tables. And yet, as we have seen, God was also using him to proclaim the good news of the gospel and to perform various signs and wonders that served to confirm his message. But when he started proclaiming the gospel in some of the synagogues, he was met by violent opposition. At the end of chapter 6, Stephen is accused by a group of men from various Hellenistic synagogues of threatening God's temple and rejecting the law of Moses, the Torah. And these are very serious accusations and are the same ones, interestingly, that have been leveled against Jesus himself. And so it seems that the men of these synagogues apparently are so threatened by Stephen that they're after his very life. And our chapter today, chapter 7, is really quite an amazing chapter because in it we have Stephen's apologia, his defense of both himself but also of the gospel. Now, I don't think that Stephen was so much interested in preserving his own life as much as he was interested in defending what it was that Christianity was really teaching. Christianity wasn't about throwing out the law of Moses or those things that had been at the heart of the Jewish faith for centuries. No, it was rather a fulfillment of all of those things. And we see this in his Apologia here in our passage today, which he roots in the Old Testament scriptures themselves particularly in the law of Moses, whom his accusers are saying he is rejecting. And it's significant to note that this address is the longest of any address in the book of Acts, and it is a summary of the Old Testament, particularly of the lives and ministries of some of Israel's greatest leaders. We have Abraham in verses 2 through 8. We have Joseph in verses 9 through 17. We have Moses in verses 18 to 44, Joshua in verse 45, and David and Solomon in verses 46 to 50. And the reason that Stephen brings up these men is both to defend himself against the indictments made against him by his accusers, but also to indict the religious leaders themselves and Israel as a whole for rejecting the Messiah. Stephen shows in a very powerful way how there was a pattern of behavior in Israel, a destructive pattern that had caused them very serious problems in and throughout the entirety of their history, and which would ultimately lead to their downfall if they did not repent. And that pattern of behavior is seen in that Israel had this tendency to always resist the will of God and to even persecute those whom God was using as his instruments through whom he was moving his salvation plan forward. All of these leaders, Stephen mentions, they dealt with rejection by the Jewish people. And Stephen very clearly says that the Jewish leaders are practicing that same behavior. Now, this is remarkable because while it's supposed to be Stephen on trial— Like when Peter and the apostles had stood trial, Stephen, the defendant, he turns the tables on them, and he becomes the prosecuting attorney. And in his prosecution, his indictment, we see two major overarching themes. The first is, of course, Israel's rejection of God's messengers, and that theme is climaxed in their rejection of the Messiah. They had rejected Jesus. But then you have another theme, and that is in relation to God's sovereignty and his glory. Notice the title that Stephen uses when talking about God. It says in verse 2, And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. 
He calls God by this title, the God of glory. And then in verse 55, it says that as he's gazing into heaven, he saw the glory of God. And keep in mind that this whole time that he's standing before the Sanhedrin on trial, his very face is radiating with that same glory. As it says, his face was like that of an angel. There's so much emphasis in this passage on the glory of God. Well, why is that? Well, it's because Israel was unique in that they were a people who had been hand chosen by God to have his glory as part of their inheritance. And Paul really hones in on this in Romans chapter 9, verse 4, when he says of the Jewish people, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Now remember that though Israel had had the privilege of having in their midst the very glory of God, the glory of God left them. First, from the tabernacle, which we read about in 1 Samuel 4, and then later from the temple, which we read about in Ezekiel chapter 10. And so the tabernacle and temple became places void of the glory of the presence of God, where they were supposed to be places of fullness. And rather than the seeking of the glory of God, we find, especially when we come to the New Testament, that the Sadducees had made the temple, not God, the focal point of their religion. Everything had become about the temple, a temple that was ultimately a man-made thing. Now, God wanted to bring his glory back, but interestingly, not to the temple. No, he wanted to reveal himself in a much more intimate and personal way. And so he reveals his glory in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, which we read about in John 1.14, who became man in order to bring God's glory into the very flesh of our humanity. That's how personal God gets with us. And the writer of Hebrews really wants his listeners to catch the awesomeness of that, which is why the book opens with his saying of Jesus in verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so we see that in Jesus, the glory of God is revealed. And Stephen sees that glory at the end of chapter 7, as he's being stoned, executed at the hands of these religious leaders. And as the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is at the right hand of God. And that's how Stephen sees him. But notice that unlike the passage in Hebrews, Jesus is not sitting. No, look again. It says in verse 55 of Acts 7, But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Jesus isn't sitting. He's standing. Do you know why? Well, it's most likely because it was customary during that time, as it still is today, when you're making a defense before a judge to stand. You stand when you're presenting your case. And so what is Jesus doing? He's standing for Stephen. How beautiful is that? Remember, Jesus had promised all the way back in Matthew chapter 10. He said, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Here we find Stephen standing for Jesus. And while he's doing it, we get a glimpse into what happens also in our day-to-day lives when we choose to stand for Jesus. Jesus stands for us. He stands for us before our accusers. 
And he stands for us before the Father and bears testimony that, yes, we are his. Now, we might still face persecution and death, which Stephen does at the close of this chapter. But ultimately, when we get to heaven, we will know that we are welcome because Jesus will have already stood for us. Now, one more thing needs to be highlighted about Stephen's summation of Israel's history. And that is that from the beginning, we see that God had a glorious plan for the salvation of the world, a plan that he faithfully worked out in and through his people and eventually in and through his son, Jesus. And you know what? God hasn't changed. Neither has his promises. God has a plan for your life and for my life as well. And let me tell you, that plan, it's not thwarted by either our persecutions or our trials. Whatever those are in your life, God foresaw them. And he has a plan to reveal his glory to you in those persecutions and in those trials and to actually use them to further his plan, which, if you're faithful to him, will lead ultimately to your salvation. I want to point out something that I think we know, but we often forget. And that is that in the story of Joseph, after God had revealed through Joseph's dreams that he would rule over his brothers, his brothers subsequently sold him into slavery to nullify that promise of God. But how does the story end? Were they able to thwart God's plan? No. In fact, they only helped to further it. And that was one of the reasons Joseph was able to forgive them, because he recognized how God used even their sin against him to further his plan and to save an empire and the surrounding countries from utter ruin. At the time of the Exodus, Pharaoh also, he couldn't stop God's plan either. He tried to resist, but instead his resistance only served to make the deliverance of God's people all the more fruitful as Israel consequently gained favor in the eyes of the humbled Egyptians who gave them whatever they asked for, and thus they were able to plunder the Egyptians, as Exodus 12.36 says. And it was that plundering of the Egyptians that may have actually furnished the Israelites with much of the necessary materials that they would need to build the tabernacle. Herod, in the New Testament, he also set himself to resist God in his attempt to kill Jesus, the Messiah, the true King of the Jews, but ended up only fulfilling many of the prophecies that God had given through his prophets hundreds of years prior about the Messiah and the events in and surrounding his birth. Pilate also couldn't thwart God's plan. Even when he sentenced Jesus to death, again, that only fulfilled God's plan. And even the Israelites themselves, who stood up against God's chosen leaders all throughout Israel's history, they couldn't thwart God's plan either. God's Messiah came, and his gift of salvation has been made available to all, to anybody, through the very cross that they condemned Jesus to die on. And so what God's word is revealing to you and to me today is that in the days ahead, no matter what the future holds, we know that God's plan is not going to be thwarted. And if you grasp nothing else from our time together today, at the very least, walk away with the knowledge that God is in control over everything. And he wants you to live in a relationship of faith and trust in him. If we can do that, then the story of God's salvation and his glory can be our story as well. Let's embrace him in faith and in trust in and through his son, Jesus. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word. 
and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.